coming up on this week's show. Nigeria's looted treasures and the battle to get them back. They will not have any other choice than to release what belongs to us because the whole world knows they are stolen properties. We get the lowdown on Europe's sleeper trains. The private companies that are now embracing this new passion for sleeper travel are getting people back onto trains and away from short-haul budget flights. And we head to South America and what's officially the most electrifying place on Earth. So in una cosa que está en firme en su, su lugar. Una señal como esto, naturaleza, uno ve, una señal que se será fuerza y fortaleza para uno. Hello and welcome to The Travel Show, coming to you this week from the historic university city of Cambridge in the UK. Now it's the beginning of term and students are coming back and like many generations before them, they'll be benefiting from some of the best educational resources in the world. And that includes valuable treasures looted from afar on colonial expeditions. But we're here because the university has recently announced it's actually returning some of those, specifically Benin bronzes, to Nigeria. And it's there, in what was once known as the Kingdom of Benin, that I want to start this story. For centuries, this street, Igun Eromion, has been famous for one particular craft bronze casting. Its name literally translates to the place where bronze works are made. Just five minutes from the palace, traditionally it was the royal family and dignitaries who'd commissioned pieces to mark historical events. Ibe Anthony spent 15 years mastering his craft. I've been into bronze casting from childhood. I was taught by my father, which my father was taught by the forefathers, and it, it has been a family business, family work. So we grown into it as a living. He's part of an exclusive guild of bronze casters, which has 120 members that mostly work on this street. All practicing a centuries old technique where wax models are used to create a detailed mould for the bronze to be cast in. It will take up to two weeks to make a piece, and it will take up to a month, depends on the size of the job, or the artwork. Whenever a tourist comes to Nigeria, they want to visit this place, so they buy and they Commission works. Whilst the technique has remained the same, most are working off printed images with little access to their ancestors' original works. We have few ones that are still left, which is in our family houses here. And um, we still have them in catalogs. Yes, there are few, not much. We don't have much access to it because uh, much of them have been stolen. I feel bad and I'm not too happy because it's our, it's our treasure. It's what our forefathers labored to do. It's reckoned around 10,000 pieces were looted by the British when they sacked Benin in 1897, burning down the city's palace in the process. The bronzes were then sold to institutions around the world. Now, there's no law in the UK which forces museums or other places to return stolen artefacts, but some institutions are doing it independently, like Jesus College Cambridge. 
They were the first institution in the world to return a Benin bronze in 2021. More recently, Germany handed back 22 bronzes and agreed to release over a thousand items from their collections. The Horniman in London has also sent pieces back to Nigeria. And soon, Cambridge University's Museum of Archaeology and Anthropology will follow suit. We've identified 116 objects that were taken during the punitive expedition of 1897, and those are the objects that we will be transferring ownership of. I think it's impossible to overstate just how severe an act of vandalism and cultural uh, violence this was. The, uh, the heads that we see before us here were several of the objects that graced ancestral altars throughout the palace and the purpose of those altars was very much to maintain the lineage, to maintain the kingdom. The plaques that were had been removed from the walls throughout the city were visualizations of uh, the Benin Kingdom's history and heritage, and those were all taken away in a wholesale export of, of, of this material, leaving very, very little behind. Tell me, why are you now, and only now, returning some of the pieces? I think it's the right time for these collections to go back. One might say it's long overdue. I think the main reason, the most cre recent reason, is that there has been a request from uh, the Nigerian government. And I think fundamentally for us, it's the right thing to do. These were still and these were looted. There are many, many different ways in which objects came to museums like this. There's such an awareness, both within the UK and internationally, of museums, colonial legacies, uh, but also of the cultural heritage that is represented in museum collections. And we want the future retelling and care of these collections to be something that's really, really collaborative. Now, this is not a sentiment shared by all. Currently, the British Museum in London has more than 900 items from the historic kingdom of Benin, the largest collection of bronzes in the world with no current plans to return any. The British Museum sent the travel show a statement where they say that the collections offer an important opportunity for audiences to understand the history of the British conquest of Benin City and to reflect on the impact of that period of colonialism. They're in dialogue with the Nigerian government about this, but also cite the British Museum Act of 1963. That it's their founding responsibility to care for the collection on behalf of the world. Not just the bronzes, but all the objects kept here. Now, undoubtedly, that's not something that sits too well back in Nigeria. The National Museum in Benin has the most accessible collection of bronzes for tourists to see though a fraction of what it perhaps should be. A time is coming for the British, for London in particular. When they see neighboring countries around them bringing the objects, they will not have any other choice than to release what belongs to us. Because the whole world knows they are stolen properties. There is no place like home. By the time this object comes home, it's going to do a lot of things. It will heal the wounds. It will create more jobs for our people. It will create more tourists to visit our museums. And on that note, plans are underway to build a brand new museum to house their returning heritage. The Edo Museum of West African Art is scheduled to open in 2026, and they're optimistic it'll be filled with their missing bronzes. Fingers crossed, the museum project goes smoothly. But if you can't wait that long, here are some alternatives from around the world that you could consider. Starting in Asia, the National Museum of Cambodia in Phnom Penh is filled with reclaimed stolen statues. A lot of the items here were looted from temples across the country, including from the famous Angkor Wat. A team is constantly working on tracing and bringing back their antiquities from museums and private collectors around the world. Over in Canada, 
the Winnipeg Art Gallery has recently opened a centre showcasing the world's largest collection of Inuit art. It's called Kao Ma Yuk, which means it's bright, it is lit, with the building very much inspired by being in the Arctic landscape. More than 27,000 artworks are on display, including a large portion which is on loan from the northern communities. Travelling south into the US, why not check out the first American National Museum designed and run by Indigenous peoples? It's part of the Smithsonian Institution Group, this one based in Washington. The building is made out of materials closely connected to the native communities across the continent. Inside, you'll find more than 800,000 objects, along with regular workshops and talks. Over to Morocco next, where you may remember we sent Adi to the newly opened Modern African Art Museum in Marrakesh. There you'll find lots of artworks from around the country. Its whole thing is about making art accessible, and the first Sunday of every month you pay whatever you want or can afford to enter. Finally to Papua New Guinea where its National Museum in Port Moresby has the task of protecting and preserving the country's cultural, military and natural heritage. Some locals see it as a spiritual home due to its heritage inside. Alongside its archaeological objects, it also has natural history specimens and contemporary local artworks. OK, so stick around because there is loads more still to come in the programme. Simon's got his top tips for booking onto Europe's sleeper trains. And the place where lightning almost certainly strikes twice. For me, the first time I saw the light, but reflected in the lake. And for me, it was a spectacular, very beautiful moment. At that moment, I imagined the night as a face, as a beautiful face, a face of stars and of the moon. Hello and welcome to London St Pancras International, Britain's European train terminal and one of the most beautiful rail stations in the world. In East Asia, Covid travel restrictions are finally unwinding in 2023. While mainland China is still closed to tourists, Hong Kong has lifted almost all its pandemic-related rules. Overseas arrivals must simply take a lateral flow test within 24 hours of their flight departing to Hong Kong. Back here in Europe, ferry links are being restored after the peak of the pandemic. The fascinating French port of Le Havre, a UNESCO World Heritage Site and gateway to the Seine Maritime region, gets reconnected with Portsmouth in southern England from March. Also restored international rail services from Renfe, the main Spanish train operator, from Barcelona to Lyon in southern France. Which brings us on to my tip of the month. Improvements in European rail services have made a cross-continental journey an increasingly cheap and appetising prospect this year. For example, on the main high-speed link in Spain between the two biggest cities, Madrid and Barcelona, travellers can now choose from four competing operators. Plenty of €9 Euro one-way tickets are available, booking several months ahead, and even at short notice, you can typically pay just 35 euros. Great news too for those of us who believe that the most civilised way to travel across Europe is by sleeper train. A new Dutch enterprise, European Sleeper, is starting an overnight service from Brussels, Antwerp, Rotterdam and Amsterdam to Berlin. Travel writer Monisha Rajesh, who's about to head off on a trip to Istanbul on three separate sleeper services. It can be expensive, um, but there are plenty of options depending on your budget and what kind of journey you're looking for. Um, tickets start at the very lower end, um, where you can travel in an upright seat overnight. But you can get seats for starting at around 45 euros 
going up to around 270 if you want to be in a private compartment with a lovely big bed and an ensuite bathroom. Tell me more about the new Brussels to Berlin sleeper. Is it really significant? I think it is because I think the private companies that are now embracing this new passion for sleeper travel are getting people back onto trains and away from short-haul budget flights, which is what I think all of us want to see because of climate change. Can an overnight train really compete with fast and uh, frequent and generally low-cost flight? I think it's quite hard to get people to come onto a train for 16 hours at a cost which might be double what you would spend on a flight. But I think you will find people at least looking into it more, considering train travel. Um, and if they don't have to be somewhere very fast, I think it's something that people will definitely embrace. Lots of viewers are asking why long haul airfares, particularly on routes from Europe to Asia and Australia, have increased so much. Well, partly the Russian invasion of Ukraine is to blame. It's greatly increased fuel costs, which are all the more significant on very long flights. Also, the closure of Russian and Ukrainian airspace means that many routes have to travel much further. Staying with air travel, what's happening with airport security checks here in the UK? Well, by June next year, the current limits on liquids, aerosols and gels should be lifted, making the security checks much faster and less stressful. That's all for now from here at London St Pancras International. Wherever your next rail journey takes you, I hope it's a great success. And do keep sending in your travel questions. For now, from me, goodbye. I'll see you next time. Now, here in the UK, we are slightly obsessed with the weather, but maybe not quite as much as in the lightning capital of the world. OK, that's not its real title, but in a remote part of Venezuela, where the Catatumba River meets Lake Maracaibo, lightning strikes 140 to 60 nights a year for hours on end. Cat Mo has been finding out more. This is what the Earth's capital of lightning looks like. La primera vez que we fui allí y nos sorprendió la noche allí en Bobures. Y para mí fue algo demasiado extraordinario. ¿Por qué? Porque por, por vez primera yo vi el relámpago pero reflejado en el lago. Y para mí fue un espectáculo demasiado hermoso. Ese momento Yo me imaginaba la noche como un rostro, como un hermoso rostro oscuro de estrellas y de luna, pero qué relámpago, era la sonrisa de la noche. This is Relámpago del Catatumbo, or Catatumbo Lightning. It's only found in one remote part of Venezuela and only accessible by boat, along a route largely populated by wildlife. A three-hour journey from Puerto Concha the lightning occurs above an area where the Catatumbo River meets Lake Maracaibo. Average temperatures here can hit above 32 degrees Celsius all year round. Some of the nearest human neighbours to this amazing display are in a village built on stilts called an ologa. Es algo extraordinario este relámpago. ¿Por qué es extraordinario? Es bueno, un fenómeno meteorológico excepcional en nuestro planeta. Porque es el único fenómeno meteorológico en el mundo que se ha convertido en la historia a través de 2000 años de una región, parte importante de la visión cosmogónica de los pueblos indígenas de tanto Guayú como los Yupa y por supuesto los Barí. Locals say Catatumbo lightning is a symbol a symbol of respect from nature. Here, they call it ploy, which in English means curiosity. Y aunque hay grande verano, siempre permanece. Deja allá al alto bajir se conoce. Se ve en ese relámpago así, señor. 
Una señal como esto, naturaleza, uno ve, es una señal que se, se dan fuerza y fortaleza para uno. Mientras está en eso, permanece la, la nube, llega. Al pasar del tiempo, en la ciencia se, se interesa por el fenómeno, ¿no? Y es allí cuando la NASA, incluso cuando se hace un estudio, en el cual eh, a través de 11 años de observación meteorológica, en que el, relámpago, el, el sitio del relámpago del Catatumbo es la región del planeta con mayor generación de relámpagos por kilómetro cuadrado al año, que son 250. Entonces es allí cuando se me ocurre la idea de, con esta, con esta evidencia científica, solicitar a Guinness World Record, un récord Guinness para el relámpago del Catatumbo, el 28 de enero del año 2014, es cuando eh, Récord Guinness oficialmente reconoce el relámpago del Catatumbo, en la región del relámpago del Catatumbo, como el sitio de mayor recurrencia de tormentas eléctricas en el, sobre el planeta. NASA ha since declared it Earth's lightning capital. Catatumbo's 250 lightning flashes per square kilometer every year equates to a staggering total of 1.6 million volts of lightning annually. The strikes are often visible for seven to 10 hours per night. If the elements could write poetry across the sky, it would surely look like this. Well, that's it for this time, but join us next week if you can, when... Oh, crafty, look at this. Christa's in Switzerland, finding out about how a vast network of bunkers lying beneath the surface oh, wow. have been adapted over the years. Mm. Oh, that's Long. lovely. And she heads to a hot air balloon festival with a unique view of the Swiss Alps. This word gets used a lot, but there's something quite magical about being up here. But don't forget, until then, you can find a whole load of other amazing travel content from the BBC online by using the tags on your screen right now. Until then, from me and the rest of the team here in Cambridge, it's goodbye.